I want to take just a moment before I introduce Sue Blackmore to recognize one of the legends of science who's here with us today, the inventor of human-powered flight, solar-powered flight, electric cars, Paul McCready. Why don't you stand up and give us a wave? Where are you, Paul? There he is, Paul McCready. Voted as the engineer of the 20th century. Welcome, Paul. It's great to see you here. He always comes to these events, and it's always good to see him. Say hi to Paul uh, on one of the breaks. Well, you're in for quite a treat here. Sue Blackmore is one of the most interesting people I've ever encountered in the skeptical business. When I first got in, into this, Sue was um, uh, one, of the, one of the mega stars who had actually just come from the dark side. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, yes, it was light. And uh, uh, as an experimentalist, experimental psychologist, she put to the test her uh, beliefs in the paranormal and ended up becoming a skeptic. <laughs> she is a visiting lecturer at the University of West England in Bristol. She's the author of numerous books, Beyond the Body, Dying to Live, which we have here, In Search of the Light, which is her autobiographical story about coming to the light, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> Uh, test Your Psychic Powers, The Meme Machine, which is her development of Richard Dawkins' original idea of memes into a whole theory, which we have a copy of that here. Her latest book is Consciousness and Introduction, which I very positively reviewed in Scientific American. It's a great book it's out in paperback now, which we have here. And uh, soon to come is the short introduction to uh, consciousness, because as you can see, it's a huge subject. With that, please help me welcome one of the giants of skepticism, Sue Blackmore. There's something wonderful about this stage. It makes me want to get up here and run around in circles again. Um, uh, we saw plenty of illusions last night, and I'm going to be talking about some illusions this afternoon, only rather different kind of illusions. But then, in a way, I seem to have spent all my life chasing after illusions. And wherever I go, I end up in illusion. So nothing changes. As um, Michael mentioned, as many of you know, long, long time ago, I... Uh, had a dramatic out-of-the-body experience 35 years ago when I was a student. And I was absolutely convinced that my soul had left my body and there were spirits and souls and, 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 and astral projection and telepathy and clairvoyance. And because I'd experienced it myself, so I knew. And I was going to prove to the, uh, all my closed-minded lecturers at Oxford that there are more things in heaven and earth than are spoken of in your philosophy. We've heard this today already. So amazing how often Shakespeare gets into the, uh, the believers' mouths. Anyway, so I, I, I devoted my life to, to this. And as you probably know, fairly soon discovered that if you do the experiments, you find that telepathy, clairvoyance, ghosts, uh, alien abductions, and so on are illusions. Some of them very interesting illusions, some of them uh, not very interesting illusions. <laughs> well, after all this, I thought, well, all of this was in a sense a red herring. Because in that very dramatic experience that I had all those years ago, I, I somehow sensed that it was possible to be in states of consciousness where you just know that this is somehow important, might not be, of course, but um, things seem more real, more vivid, you seem more alive, more conscious. That was what I wanted to understand. It was kind of a red herring. I, I thought the way to understand that was to go into the paranormal, but it wasn't. So after 35 years, well, no, it was about five years ago, 30 years later, I finally go, hey, hang on a minute, wasn't there something I really wanted to understand? Yes, this, you know? What am I? Who am I? What does it mean to be conscious? Ah, uh, I'm experiencing this great room here. What is that? How does the brain do it? So, I need to, uh, I need to find out about consciousness. Forget all that paranormal stuff that I've been battling on as renter skeptic for all those years. Um, let's get down to the real questions about consciousness. So, I gave up my job, spent three years writing the textbook. Um, I mean, that's, you know, if you want to find out about something and there isn't a textbook, hey, that's the way to do it. Go and write the textbook. And then you, I, I thought if I spent three years and read everything, you know, I could get my hands on on consciousness, then I'd really understand it. Hmm. <laughs> it's amazing how little you can read even in three years. It's quite frightening. Anyway, that's, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the, the fruits of this exploration uh, now. But remember... Some of you here are uh, as old as me, and you'll remember that when you were students, you couldn't use the C word. 
It was just the end of behaviorism, and you were not allowed to talk about consciousness. I don't believe that word ever came up in my, my three years of physiology and psychology. But now, things are very different. Now, scientists are falling over themselves. It's the greatest mystery left for science. It's the ultimate mystery. It's the last surviving mystery, the most baffling problems. And so, at last, we're allowed to have a go at consciousness. But, what is it? Would you please, just for a moment, be very conscious? Laugh, that won't make you very conscious. In fact, that'll be the opposite. So, shh. All right, you know what I'm talking about, don't, don't you? Don't, yeah? But can we define it? No. In, it, throughout science and philosophy, there's no real agreed definition of what we mean by consciousness. But the closest I can get to, con to, to some sort of a definition is to tell you what I mean in terms of a very famous paper written by the, the philosopher Thomas Nagel in 1974. And the title of this, pardon? Did somebody say something? Was that me? Was it, was it, enough? Was it, it was a voice from outer space. I think I must have hit my microphone. Um, it was this paper in 1974 called, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? <laughs> now, in this paper, Nagel claimed to have demolished all of materialism forever and made various other claims, but and that didn't survive. But what has survived from that paper are two things, really. He made what is a very obvious point, but worth remembering, that if we ask, what is it like to be a bat, we, we don't know. Uh, could I have a bat, please? Who, who would like to be a bat? Could I have a volunteer, please? Uh, you, madam, would you like to be a bat? No, no? Well, how about you? you yeah, come on, right, up, up, come, come and be a bat, please. Yep, right. Up here, please. Now, Mr. Bat, would you please just be a bat for us? Do your best. <laughs> now, come on. That's not very convincing. Come on, come on. You can do better than that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. How about a bit of a squeaking, maybe? Yeah, yeah. It's like... Suck your blood. <laughs> well, thank you. I think we'll send the vampire back down again. Thank you very much. Now, the point that Nagel was making was this. Um, if, if, sorry, what was your name, sir? Robert. If Robert um, really became a bat, which I don't think he did, did he? Um, if he really became a bat, he would have to give up memory and, and thinking and everything that he has because he's a human, and so he wouldn't be able to answer the question. But if he became a sort of bat who could think and so on, then, then um, it wouldn't really be a bat. So we can't find out. Actually, I don't, can't find out whether you're conscious. I, I, you know, I, I mean, I know, I know deep down you're not, but you know, you might try to convince me that you are. So that was one point. But the more important point, which is what I'm, why I mention this at all, is because he said this. If there is something it is like to be the bat, doesn't matter what, if there's something it is like to be the bat, that's what we mean by the bat being conscious. And if there's nothing it's like to be the bat, then that's what we mean by it not being conscious. Is there anything it's like to be this bottle? No? no? I only heard one shout. Is there anything it's like to be this bottle? No. <laughs> we, have a, we have a panpsychist over here. Most people say no. Of course we can't know, but that's, that doesn't matter. The point for now is that's what I mean by consciousness. If there's something it is like to be the bottle, the bottle is conscious, and otherwise it's not. So is there something it's like to be me? Well, that's the question. If I'm conscious, then there is. And of course, we can ask about all these other animals. Now, people ask questions as they did ask Christoph Koch this morning. Um, are, you know, are animals conscious? Well, I, I wouldn't answer that question because I don't know what we mean. I don't know how we'd find out. I don't know how we could test it. So, um, unlike him, I wouldn't give an answer. Now, what, what's the problem about this? What, what, why should this be the greatest mystery to science? Well, I need my trusty bottle again, I think. Um, why is it the greatest mystery to science? Well, just be conscious again for a moment, will you? I'm sure you've all lapsed into some sort of <laughs> unconsciousness. Now, come back and have a look at this bottle, okay? Now, each one of you, I wager, is having a unique experience of the sight of that bottle. 
It's a slightly kind of, blue, I don't know what color it looks to you. Probably looks a different color to everybody because, it, you know, it's reflecting different bits, okay? Now, you are having conscious experiences of bottle looking, yeah? <laughs> now, I'm sure you also believe that there is a physical world in which there is an actual bottle. Now, I know this is old hat. I know this is three, 2,000, probably 3,000-year-old philosophy, but it's important. You're having private experiences that you can't share with anybody else, that you can't even really say what it's like seeing the color of this bottle. Those are your experiences. And yet you also believe that there's a physical world out there in which there is a real bottle. There seem to be two different kinds of things in the world, mind and body, inner and outer, uh, subjective and objective. They seem to be completely different kinds of things. How can there be two different kinds of things in the world. There are any number of reasons why dualism of Descartes' form or various other forms just doesn't work. If you've got two totally different things in the world, they've either got to interact, in which case they're not totally different, or if they can't interact, you're not going to explain anything. So, dualism won't work. Somehow we have to see how these things are related, but it seems too difficult, which is why people have been trying for a very, very long time and uh, falling into the... Uh, Fathomless abyss, as it used to be called in the 19th century. Um, the great chasm between mind and brain. Now, curiously, as we get better at science, and as we can draw pictures like um, Terry Sinovsky just drew uh, with, with all those circuits and everything, the more we know, in a way, the worse the problem gets. <laughs> because we can talk and think about brain cells. How does, all, how does this, these brain cells do it? It's been called The Hard Problem by Dave Chalmers. And <laughs> it's quite a funny story how the, how the phrase The Hard Problem came about. It was the first ever Tucson conference. And for any of you interested in consciousness, I thoroughly recommend the Tucson conferences. They're um, every two years in, in April in Tucson. And it was the first one which he'd helped set up. And he went, got up on the stage to give a really complicated, obscure, difficult, logical discourse on something or other to do with consciousness as a, as a philosopher to philosophers. And he said, well, just before I begin on this, you know, important, complicated thing, I just want to clear up one thing. I'm not talking about the easy problems of perception and learning and memory and, you know, how the brain works. Um, I'm glad you're laughing. Um, I'm talking about the hard problem. Consciousness itself. <laughs> and he defines it like this. The question of how physical processes give rise to subjective experience. He's already in trouble. He's already using the words give rise to, which implies something that is kind of exuded from the brain, something that is separate from the processes of the brain. So he's already, by phrasing it that way, committing himself to some kind of dualism. At least he is honest, and he does actually end up being a dualist, um, unlike uh, most people. But it's very, very hard to phrase the problem without getting yourself into some kind of a trap. So I'll avoid the traps by not saying any more, and simply say, that's the locus of the problem. If you, if you don't think it's serious, may I politely suggest you haven't thought about it hard enough. It's really, really difficult. So what are we going to do about it? Some people, and I think it's a perfectly sensible strategy, though it's not mine, like, like Francis Crick and um, Christoph Koch, would say, Let, let's just forget all that philosophy stuff and get on with something useful. And I would say that what they're getting on is something useful, but it's not getting at consciousness in the way I want to talk about it. So I'm going to do something rather different instead. In fact, I'm going to suggest that consciousness is an illusion. I've, said the ti I've called the title of my um, talk The Grand Illusion, and there's a whole thread of arguments going through consciousness studies at the moment about grand illusion theory. Um, some people say it started with me, although I didn't, I'm not sure that's right, but I did do uh, some experiments on change blindness in 1995, and the paper was called Is the Richness of Our Visual World an Illusion? And I'll come to that later. But it was Alva Noe who coined the term uh, Grand Illusion, and then other people have said there isn't any illusion. So that, hence, the grand, grand illusion, illusion theory. <laughs> and so the arguments have gone on. Um, but I'm, I want to argue today that consciousness is a grand illusion. But I've got to be clear what I mean by illusion. 
I do not mean that it doesn't exist. Uh, Dan Dennett gets this all the time, people saying, oh, you just think consciousness doesn't exist. No, it's an, it's an illusion. So illusion is, def is defined, I, I actually went to the dictionaries because I got so frustrated with people telling me that I was saying that consciousness doesn't exist. Um, and looked at the dictionary, and this is what you find. An illusion is something mentally misleading, something that deceives you, uh, a false notion or impression. So, sorry to labor this, but I don't want you to make that mistake as I'm going along. So an illusion, I'm saying, is something that does exist, but it's not what it seems to be. Now, visual illusions are good examples. Um, they're not, I'm talking about something much uh, more difficult to grasp when I come onto consciousness, but at least if we start with visual illusions, then you can see that um, um, it, 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 it just makes my point that something exists, but it's not what you think it is. So what do you see there that I'm sure you can tell that that is just a lot of black and white lines, but um, uh, what can you see that is not, um, see not actually? Eye. You see an eye, yeah? Anything else? Perspective, you see depth, yes, it disappears into the distance. Anything else? Color. color. Who can see color? Yeah, lots of you can see colors. Um, anything else? I see, a, I see a bat. You see a bat. <laughs> My God. I should have had him to be the bat, shouldn't I? I'll think of something better for you later. Um, anything else? Anyone see movement? Yeah. I can't look at it. It upsets me too much. Okay, so you're used to the idea of things that are not what they appear to be. Now, this is quite simple. This isn't going to upset you terribly in the way that I hope some of the things later might. Um, <laughs> because you're quite happy to say, okay, I know it's black and white lines, and I know that all this stuff I can see is kind of in my head or something like that. Um, so so uh, it's a different kind of illusion I'm going to be talking about, but it's still the point that you're making a jump, uh, a, a kind of a, assumption that you know doesn't reflect what, what is really there. And here's another example. And all, all that is there, as I'm sure you will agree, is seven black circles with some bits missing. But I bet you cannot help jumping to the conclusion that your visual system will set up for you um, that there is a cube there. You may even be able to see the cube in depth, and you may even, although it's not a NECA cube, you may still be able to flip the perspective <laughs> of a cube that isn't even there. <laughs> so we're quite used to the idea that we jump to conclusions. But perhaps we're not quite used to the idea that we jump to such desperate conclusions as some of the ones we jump to when it comes to consciousness. Now, if I'm going to say that consciousness is an illusion, I'm saying it's not what it seems to be. So obviously, I need to start with what it seems to be. What does it seem to be? How does it seem to you? Okay, let's try it again. You're getting good at this now. Now, just be conscious for a moment. How does it seem? It seems like a Cartesian theater. I can't say it like you do, but uh, does it seem a bit like this? Hands up if it seems a bit like this. Yeah. Uh, not very many of you putting your hands up. I mean, obviously, I don't mean you really believe there's a little homunculus inside your brain pulling the levers. I didn't say, do you believe the brain contains a little man with wires coming in from the ears? No. Does it feel like this? Does it feel as though you are inside looking out? I submit that, on the whole, it does. If it never does, did feel like that to you, or you've done so much meditation or other practices of that kind that you've dropped the notion, then fine. But I think for most people, it's something like this. It feels as though I'm in here. I'm in here receiving all the inputs that come in to me. I'm the one who's experiencing them in a kind of stream of events that goes through my consciousness, and I make the decisions, the equivalent of pulling the levers. That's how it feels, but it can't be that way. I mean, Terry's wonderful picture that he started and ended with there is one way you can see how it can't be that way, because there's just a massive system with stuff going all over the place. In fact, that was a rather simplified system. We know there are many in the visual system, there are probably 30 or 40 independent, parallel, not independent exactly, but parallel streams going through, not just the few that he showed there. And it's a massively parallel system with no middle. 
It's not just that there isn't a place where the little man with the, with the things could sit. It's that the brain isn't organized that way. It isn't that everything comes in and goes to the center where consciousness happens and then the orders go out. It isn't like that. It, it's massive parallel throughput. The, you know, the things that this body here is doing now have not all gone through anywhere. There are lots of things going on. And like Christoph said, you know, <laughs> oh, those words coming out. How interesting. What's she going to say now? <laughs> Quite frightening when you think about it, isn't it? I don't know what she might say. Now, this was named by Dan Dennett, the Cartesian theater, as, as somebody there rightly said. And what Dennett said for a variety of reasons was that when you discard Cartesian dualism, which he said everybody does, nearly everybody does, that you really must discard the show that would have gone on in the Cartesian theater and the audience as well. Because neither the show nor the audience can be found in the brain, and the brain is the only real place there is to look for them. So, we have to throw out the show and the audience. I think he was right. He called all those people who don't throw out the show and the audience Cartesian materialists. People who still hang on, they say they're materialists, unlike, for example, Chalmers, who says he's a dualist. They say they're materialists. In other words, they believe the world is all made of matter and we have to explain it all that way. And yet, they still have this kind of metaphor of consciousness, that there is a kind of time or place in the brain into which information comes, that things become conscious, and I experience them. We have heard that twice today in the two talks about consciousness so far. Christoph Koch talked about consciousness. He talked about things coming into consciousness. He talked about the brain generating consciousness. And he talked about the conscious and the unconscious processes in the brain. Ter Terry Sainovsky also talked about um, the, what he was talking about, the unconscious stuff, non-conscious stuff, as being just uh, the conscious being the tip of the iceberg, as though there's a kind of conscious level. And things rise to the level of consciousness, he said. Now, all that is Cartesian materialism thinking. It's, it, it's giving the, the idea that there's somebody watching and there's a show going on. There are things that are in consciousness and out of them. Well, Dennett says it can't be like that. that you could say that the show is the stream of consciousness. This, this wonderful phrase um, coined originally by William James in 1890. Um, I can thoroughly recommend reading the Principles of Psychology, 1890. It's only 1160 pages, but um, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And he, he coined the, the term, the stream of consciousness. Um, he said, consciousness doesn't appear to itself chopped up in bits. It flows. So a river or a stream are the metaphors that naturally um, come to mind. So let's call it the stream of consciousness or the stream of subjective life. The implication here, I think, is that all the time you're awake, there's something or other in your consciousness, you know? There's lots of stuff that isn't, you know, um, all the machinations going on in your brain and in your enteric nervous system and in your immune system, and all, you know, and you are not conscious of those. You're only conscious of the things in the stream, as though it's a kind of continuous all day long as the things that you're conscious of. Well, is that true? Well, let's throw that up in the air and think about it. That's, that's what I want to do. I want to say that uh, that, that is the common assumption that that's how it is all day long. There's you having conscious experiences and making your conscious decisions and making things happen. So I want to have a little bit of fun uh, having a go at that and asking whether that really is the right way of thinking about it, whether I should become a Cartesian materialist after all. So I'm going to ask you a question. Do you believe in free will? Do you believe that you can, and I'm defining it this way, do you believe that you can consciously control the actions of your body? Hands up if you believe in free will. Hands up if you believe you can consciously control the actions of your body. Okay. Okay, put your hands down. Hands up if you don't believe you can consciously control the actions of your own body. Right, that's about, I should say that's about three to one, and hands up if you didn't put your hands up already. Oh, what a lot of cowards. Uh, well, I shall make you commit yourself one way or another later. Yeah. Right. Okay, um, let's, can we have the lights up a bit, please? Because I need to be able to see my guinea pigs. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, guinea pigs. Right. Would you please, all of you, without tickling the person in front too much, hold out your hand. I'm just going to give you an example of doing something of your own free will, okay? Hold out your hand like this. Now, 
whenever you feel like it, spontaneously and of your own free will, not when I tell you, not when the person next to you tells you to do it, when you want to do it, just flip your hand. Now, I want you to keep doing this for quite a long time. You'll see why in a minute. And just get used to the feeling of what it's like to do this task. When you want to do it, when you decide consciously you're going to do it, okay? I bet about 5% of you thought, I'm going to use my free will and not do it at all. <laughs> Hands up, you. <laughs> so predictable. You see, there's no free will. Um, <laughs> right. Now, what I want to ask you is, how do you think that works? There's no question, those of you who did it, the hand moves. What starts the process of the hand moving? Suggestions. The decision. Okay, one says the decision. One says you did. Any other advances on that? Urge. What? Urge. urge. An urge. Okay, a decision, an urge, uh, you. Did you mean you as in me? Yes. You meant that I... Okay, so I told you to do it. You wouldn't have done it if it hadn't been... For, but, but I'm getting at the timing. You chose when. So it's a question of what started that to happen then rather than, than later. Random noise. Random noise, Okay. I decided to. Okay, so some say it's me, some say it's you. Random noise, uh, an urge, a decision. My free will controlled me. Your free will controlled you. Ah, mm, he's got free will and a self. Fine. Yep. A any more? Any more suggestions? What? You picked a pattern. Yes, you can do that. Um, you can decide you're going to do it every second or something. Yeah. You ordered it, okay, that's another one of the, the self in there, yes? I have no idea. Hey, yes, thank goodness, there's not somebody who doesn't know, yes? <laughs> Everyone else obviously heard that, I didn't. Can you say it a bit louder? <laughs> genetically weak. No, they're memetically weak, not genetically weak. Right. Now, why do I get, sorry, we'll have to stop you there, but we, you can, nobody has said brain mechanisms other than the, the noise theory, but, um, yes? Basal ganglion, okay. A result of a cost-benefit analysis, yes, I'm not sure what the cost, oh yeah, there's some cost. <laughs> I'm not sure there's much cost or benefit, but yes, it's still got to happen, hasn't it? Okay. Um, we could roughly divide um, those kinds of answers into two sorts. One, that there's something like a decision, a self, conscious decision, an urge, all of those kind of things, which are kind of mental terms. Or we can take uh, a sort of physical answers. There's something happening in the brain. There's a, there's a pattern building up. There's a random noise building up. Um, you know, it hits a certain level or something of that kind. There's some kind of activity starting in the basal ganglion or somewhere. Now, could we find out? The reason I got you to do this task is because it is the basis of the most famous experiment ever done in consciousness studies. It's a very old experiment, 20 years old now, but it's still interesting. And this was Libet's experiment on spontaneous deliberate action. And what he did was he wired people up. He got them to do exactly what you've been doing, and he wired them up with uh, an electro uh, myogram on the wrist to give an exact time of when the wrist moved. And he wired them up with um, EEG, electroencephalogram, electrodes over the motor cortex. You have to know, and it was known well in, in advance of these experiments in the 80s, that prior to a skilled action, like moving your hand, there's a buildup of activity called the readiness potential in motor cortex. In some of the books, which I'm sure you've read, they talk about it as though it's a sort of blip. It's not. It's more like, you know, you're going along the EEG like this, and then you gradually have a ramp that goes up, and then when the action happens, it, it goes down again. So it's the beginning of this readiness potential that, that is the, the start of the motor cortex getting ready to do something. So that was known. So now, we know when the thing moves. We know when the brain starts gearing up to make the action happen. 
How do we find out when the person consciously decided to move? Hmm. Tricky, eh? Because this is a mental term. This is their conscious decision. If we measure anything physical, we're back as, you know, motor cortex and so on. But what about consciousness itself, the moment they decided? Well, this was a little bit genius that he invented a method. He had a spot revolving on a screen. So, right, are you ready, guinea pigs? I'm going to be the spot, and you're going to be the subjects. Now, what you have to do is you have to hold out your hand as before, and you have to flip your wrist as before. But what you have to do now is become, is, is, is watch when you decide to move. And I want you to shout out where the spot is when you decide to move, okay? So if, if you decide to move when, my, when the spot's here, say 12, one, two, three, wherever it is, I want you to shout, okay? So hold out your hand and here we go. I want you to shout where it is. Come on, all of you, join in. Thank you. <laughs> well done, very good. <laughs> right. It's brilliant to see all of you doing it like that because it completely refutes one of the very common arguments that people can't do it. Of course they can, you just did it. I'm not sure quite what you're doing but you're doing something. Now, what Libet could then do, you see, you have to note that it's very clever, this, because it doesn't matter how long it takes you to say three. You could wait five minutes and say three later if you like. The point is you're making a judgment of simultaneity about that's where the, the thing was when you made, made the decision. So it's a timing of the decision with reference to an external event. And all sorts of control experiments show that, that you can do that very, very little inaccuracy in those kind of timing judgments. So, the question is, what, which came first? Did the conscious decision to move come first? Or did the beginning of the readiness potential in the motor cortex come first? Now, there are really three possibilities, either of those two, or they come together. So, I would like to see what you all think. Hands up if you think... Uh, that the activity in motor cortex started first. It's about ooh, fifth, of the, okay, thank you. Hands up if you think both happened together. Oh, even fewer. Hands up if you think the conscious decision to act came first. Uh, right, about half of you, and that leaves how many who didn't dare commit themselves? Ah, oh, pathetic. Right, okay, or else very intelligent and clever. Um, so let's find out what was the true answer. I should say the vast majority here, given the hands that went up for the conscious decision to move, came first. Um, the results are absolutely clear. Uh, up here is the um, moment of the action, where the EMG was. Here, this is a different experiment, but in most experiments, here's the beginning of the um, readiness potential, and on average, three and a, three thousand, 350 milliseconds after that comes W, will, the moment of the desire to move. Where is that being measured? Pardon? Where is that measured? That's the thing with the spot. That's the thing with the moving spot. So wherever the spot was, he can relate that, because he's got a spot on the screen, he can relate that to the... Um, uh, EMG signal. You've got the whole lot timed relative to each other. Okay? This has been confirmed again and again, more recently with PET, with fMRI, um, but it's also been done again in this way. It's a pretty robust finding. Somewhere between 300 and 500 milliseconds, that's half a second before um, you, you consciously decide to move, the brain is already gearing itself up to act. So most of you were wrong. But why on earth did you think that in the first place? For goodness sake, you're supposed to be skeptics. <laughs> the curious thing about this is, if people were actually materialists, as so many scientists claim to be, they should, this should, experiment should never have been interesting at all. 
I mean, we should have all gone, yeah, of course. Well, the brain's got to start first. I mean, you know, consciousness, whatever it is, it's not going to be kind of a magic mystery thing that's going to leap in there and go, ha, ha. well, John Eccles and a few people think that, but, you know, the, 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 the you know, interfering in the synapses theory. Um, I mean, if you think that, fine, um, that's a theory. But if you claim to be a materialist scientist and, and, and a certain sort of scientific skeptic, you should surely never have even conceived of the possibility that consciousness itself or me um, could be able to start off a process which only later becomes a physical process. So at least you should have said you should have thought they would come together. And yet, you are not alone. So I'm not trying to be unkind. <laughs> because you can see you're not alone from the hundreds and hundreds of papers written about this experiment. There have been several whole books and hundreds and hundreds of papers tearing it to shreds in every possible way. <laughs> now, I'm not going to go into the details of those. I will just give you two snippets of conclusions from it. Libet himself was horrified by the results. <laughs> And he did some further experiments that showed that sometimes people would veto the action just before they were going to move it, stop themselves. And he suggested that in these conditions, consciousness really could act to stop the thing happening. So he said, we have a conscious veto. This was very important to him because he said to me, personally, when I was discussing this with him, he said, well, you see, what it means is you, it, it, you can't help the fact that you might want to you know, murder somebody or steal something or do something terrible but at least you know that you can consciously prevent it. So it became a kind of moral issue. I think Richard Gregory, and some of you will know Richard Gregory, the uh, British psychologist famous for his work on um, visual illusions and his ghastly puns. And he said, you see, this proves that we don't have free will, we only have free won't. <laughs> Other people tried to get round it in all sorts of devious ways. The only other argument that I'll mention is that of Dan Dennett, who says, but look, the whole thing is set up in Cartesian materialism terms. Because by saying that there is such a thing as the time at which you decide, you are Im imagining the Cartesian theater. And the moment at which the decision appears in the Cartesian theater, on the screen, as it were, the metaphorical screen, the show that's happening in the theater for the audience of one, me, who does the deciding. So what's really going on, if you, if you reject Cartesian materialism, is that people are making a judgment. This can be understood in purely physical terms. They're judging that something happens, that something changes in the brain at a certain time, and they're judging when that was. And that's all we have. We don't have consciousness itself being measured, uh, let alone free will. Well, I leave you to whatever conclusions you like to draw from that. But I hope at the least it makes you think next time you walk around going... I had a slightly embarrassing experience a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was lecturing in Berlin for the weekend, and um, I had this nice group of they were psychoanalysts, and um, I did the same, same thing with them. And they seemed a little bit reluctant, and, um, but, you know, we got on fine, did the experiment at the end. And afterwards, one of them said, you know, it, it is a little difficult when you come to Germany and stand on the stage and ask everybody <laughs> to go... <laughs> Let's move on to something else. Vision. If we think about things that lie at the heart of what we mean by consciousness, free will is clearly one. But vision is perhaps for most humans, for whom vision is the predominant sense, the heart of what we think about consciousness. Look around you now. <laughs> this, this experience of being here in this room, that's a wonderful ceiling, isn't it? I mean, look at that. <gasps> wow. As you look around this room, do you, do you think that you have in your head, in your mind, somehow you've got a, a, a pretty detailed image, mental picture of, of this room? Or perhaps only the bits in front of you? General, not detail. Gen not, general not detail, but okay, you've got a general view. Huh? And it, it kind of feels like that, doesn't it? It feels like, well, I'm looking around, I know I can look at different places. I mean, you, you, I'm sure you know that... Um, the way the eye is organized, the fovea then in the center of the retina is very small, and that's the only area where you've got really good color vision and where you've got really high, high quality, um, um, high acuity vision. 
so that if you're looking straight ahead of you and don't move your eyes, like I'm looking at you, sir, probably I can only see your face clearly, and the rest is pretty much blurred, you know? Um, I have to, if I want to see something in detail, I have to look there. Mm. Nevertheless, I get this feeling that, you know, as I'm looking over here, there's all of this. It's all there somehow in my mind. I mean, that's what vision is. It, vision is kind of building up a picture of, of the room. You could say it's a bit like this. You walk into a new place where you haven't been before, and with each saccade, each large eye movement, you look around and you gradually build up a view of where you are. Would you agree that's more or less how it seems to be? That's how it feels, and that has really been the underlying assumption of cognitive psychology for its first 30 years or whatever since it began. That really vision is about building up a representation of the world. So as you look around, you suck in all the information and build up a representation of the world. Now, um, I'm going to show you a picture. I'm going to show it very briefly, so I want you to look very hard and concentrate on this picture. And afterwards, I'm going to ask you what you saw. Okay, are you ready? <laughs> right, what did you see? A devil with horns, okay, anything else? Let's, let's, I, I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're such a wonderful audience, you're all shouting at once, so I'll have to be bossy and have hands up. Who wanted to say something? Yes? Den it with horns. Den it with horns. Anything else? Den it with a scar on his face. Den it with a scar on his face. Anything else? Was there just one den it? Pardon? A repetitive pattern, yes. How many den it's? 18 den it's. Anyone want to argue with 18 den it's? Some glasses. Anything else? I saw that there were others that were modified, but I couldn't see exactly what kind of modified. He thinks others are modified. Uh, does everyone else think the others were the same or different? Same. same. Okay, so let's say we've got a rough consensus that there's 18 identical pictures of Dan Dennett and one has horns and a scar. Okay? Someone says 24. Okay, well, let's have a look. Right. There's 18 identical portraits of Dan Dennett and one has horns and a scar. Right? That's what you said. That's what you saw. So what's the problem? Not one person saw everything. Nobody saw everything. You make saccades roughly four to six times a second. Let's say five. And it's probably less. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. I showed you that picture, it's timed on the machine for two seconds. So at most, you can have made 10 saccades. Now, you probably, because you've got automatic pop-out detectors that will detect funny things like horns and scars that stick out from the overall pattern, you will have probably used or wasted or, you know, devoted four or five of your saccades to having a look at those very interesting horns and scar because they grab your attention. So you've only got oh, about five left over. You, and you... At that distance and that size, you have got to look at that each face in order to see it in detail. So you cannot conceivably have looked at all of those pictures. And yet, you came to the right conclusion, didn't you? I don't know what to conclude from this other than that you cannot take the view that vision is a matter of dragging all the information in and having a kind of show in the Cartesian theater, which is what you then see. Vision is something else. I want to show you some more change blindness pictures. You saw some this morning. Uh, don't shout out. Again, we've got the same issue here. But if, if you were taking all the information into your head, then if you moved your eyes and something changed, um, you ought to notice it. Let me just give you an example. Uh, let's say you were looking at me. And you blinked like this, and my uh, stripy top turned into a yellow and white stripy top instead. Would you notice? Yes. Yeah, you think you would. People always say they would, but they don't. <laughs> if, it, <laughs> if it changed when you're looking straight at it and not blinking, not moving your eyes, you'd change, all right? You'd see it, all right? Because you have automatic mechanisms in, in the visual system that will look for change. But if, you, if all the change, there's so much change going on when you blink or move your eyes that you wouldn't notice it. And that's what we see in these change blindness examples. So take a look at this. Hands up if you can't see something changing. Hands up if you can't see two things changing. Ah, 
Well, look for the other one then. Yeah, you can see it now. It's so arduous looking for it, isn't it? But if you had a complex picture of the world, a detailed picture of your world in your head now, you ought to be able to remember what was there. Well, in case you haven't seen them, uh, one is the keyboard and the other is the lamp on the windowsill. The third, uh, those of you who are very perceptive, the third is actually a reflection of the lamp in the mirror, which I didn't notice when I had the pictures taken. <laughs> what? Oh, come on, children, behave yourselves. Uh, what? <laughs> what? The cable, mouse cable. Oh, that is wicked. Uh, may I tell you that this is the p first person, I've been showing this picture for I don't know how many times, the first person to notice that the mouse cable is slightly different. You can see that this picture was taken by um, the genuine method of, you know, I sit there, my son who took the picture comes and moves things and take another picture. <laughs> my oh, I couldn't keep still, all right, I'll stop. I'm not going to let you find any more. <laughs> Try this one. This is not mine, this is one of Dan Simon's. Hands up who can't see what's changing. If you can't see it, okay, thank you, put them down. Well, it might help you if I tell you that um, uh, the Simons um, did this experiment to see whether it was possible um, to get change blindness when the change is right in the middle of the picture. <laughs> Got it now? <sighs> now this has um, something to do with attention, obviously. And at this point, I was going to build you up to the importance of attention and show you a very interesting video. <laughs> but since you saw it this morning, <laughs> I'll have to um, forget about that. Um, so perhaps I'll do... Oh, hang on a minute. Um, so, the change blindness, we don't see it. What is this really telling us about vision? Let's go back to this idea of building up the picture. I mean, if we're not building up a detailed picture, what really is happening? I'm just going to show you a few examples to try and kind of tease out what might be going on, what vision right, might really be if it isn't a question of building up a picture. Now let's take an example. This is a room in my house. If you were to walk in the room <coughs> with your eyes kept still, you might just look straight ahead and see the bunch of flowers sat there. That's all you, all you could see. It's, meant, it's not brilliant, but it's meant to be a representation of what you would see in detail with the fovea and the rest fading off into the distance. Now, we've seen from the change blindness things that um, you're not able to, to remember all the changes and you don't see them. But if you had no memory of what you just looked at, then vision would be something like this. You'd just keep looking around and just have an endless series of these kind of things. Could vision be like that? Could it actually be like that and somehow we're tricked into thinking we're seeing more? Is that possible? Well, in a way, it's not possible because if you didn't retain any information, you wouldn't know where to look ne next, right? Because we know if you walk into a room, you look at the things that matter, the horns. You immediately grabbed onto the horns and looked around those. So that's not very likely um, that you wouldn't store any information. Um, on the other hand, we know it's not, it's, it can't be, one extreme is that you store no information. The other extreme is this, that you build the whole thing up and store all of it. So we know from the change blindness experiments that that can't be how it is. Another suggestion of Simons and Levin is that you keep a sort of gist. You look around the place and you don't store the whole lot, but you keep a sort of layout of the whole um, picture, um, looking at little bits in detail and just keeping the gist of the scene which would fit with a change blindness, because if the whole gist ju changes, if everything changes, obviously you notice it. Well, how can we find out? Um, it's very, very difficult to, to, to th think about this. I mean, 
What we're saying really is your intuitions about vision are wrong. Mega wrong. It's not a question of you sucking in information, building up a picture in your head, which is then what you see. It's not a question of kind of the contents of consciousness. This, this is now in my consciousness. Vision doesn't work like that. So what is it like? Can we look and see what it's like? Well, surely this is my vision. I should sure be able to tell, shouldn't I? It's my consciousness, isn't it? Well, how can I tell? Um, you know, uh, how can I sort of find out what... Uh, it seems all, all the time that, that I'm building up this picture, and yet this has just told me that I'm wrong. I think William James had this exact problem. He didn't know about change blindness. But he was talking about something similar, and he concluded that introspective analysis in cases like this is like trying to seize a spinning top to catch its motion, or trying to turn up the gas quickly enough to see how the darkness looks. Isn't that wonderful? You know, quick! Oh, just, like if I do it really quickly, I'll see the, what the darkness is like. Wouldn't have you loved electricity, where you could do it really quickly? <sighs> well, the modern analogy is said to be, if you try and open the fridge really quickly to see whether the light's always on. Well, I honestly spend an awful lot of my life feeling like that poor woman there. <laughs> I like trying to catch myself out. You know, I honestly think intellectually that it must be something like this. I'm looking at you. The rest is nothing. Now I'm looking here. The rest is nothing. And now I'm looking here, and the rest is nothing. It's all scraps, disconnected bits, and somehow or another, the illusion comes about of this continuous unitary stream of experiences. It's got to be an illusion. It's not a continuous stream. It's not a rich, detailed picture in the brain. Well, what is it? And how can I find out? It's related to some other curious fact about consciousness that in a way I'm tempted to go back to. In a way I'm tempted to say we are just so confused about consciousness that we need to start all over again and thinking about it. Take this curious fact. Are you conscious now? Anyone not? <laughs> Those two aren't. Okay, we have got great, ah, oh, we got, we got Van, Van Zombie over there and, uh, and another zombie there probably. Um, two brave souls. You don't know. Okay, we've got one agnostic. <laughs> it's a curious thing, isn't it? Whenever you ask yourself, am I conscious now? The answer is always yes. It's not possible to ask yourself, and I mean, there are curious people <laughs> um, like me and Dan Dennis and a few others who would argue that it's a meaningless question, and there, and, and there are other people who do strange practices that change what they would say. But by and large, you ask that, you have to be conscious. Now this is like a fridge. I think what's happening is something like this. Every time you're forced by some means or other to think about consciousness, you think, well, am I conscious? Well, of course, it's like this. Fine. It is. I mean, every time you do it, you say, ah! But what about the rest of the time? <laughs> There's the mistake. That's what we're doing. We're assuming that all the rest of the time when we're not asking the question, it's just like that. There's me and the, and the world. There's a stream of experiences that I'm having. Yes, it's always like that when we look, in other words, when we ask that difficult question. But the rest of the time, can we look into the darkness and see what it's like? <laughs> you may laugh, but I think that some kinds of meditation, and I've been practicing very simple sitting, just sitting from Zen tradition for more than 20 years, are about this. It's very interesting. In, in, in Zen practice, two things are relevant here. One is, is koan practice, where people ask really awkward questions, such as, am I conscious now? <laughs> it's 
could be a brilliant koan, but you know, who am I? Or the ultimate Korean koan, what is this? <laughs> now you practice sitting for a week asking that. <laughs> I think it's precisely this, it's trying to look into the darkness. There's also the practice of mindfulness, which is really trying to stay asking the question all the time. It doesn't have to be put as a question, but it has, be here now. When I said to you, come on, right, let's do it. This is last time, all right, everybody? Now, just be conscious. Now, maintaining that is what is, is called mindfulness, and it's damn hard work, <laughs> because you just lapse off into blah, blah. So perhaps the fridge thing is a bit like this. Whenever you ask the question, something odd happens. It's like it all kind of gets pulled together, and there's a me is constructed, and a world is constructed. Oh, that's how it is. But the rest of the time, there's just multiple parallel stuff going on in the brain, just like in, in Terry's picture. All these things are doing their stuff. There's no things that are in consciousness and out of consciousness. There's no sense in which we can find the contents of consciousness or the neural correlates of the contents, because the contents don't exist. This is a totally different way of going about trying to understand consciousness. It could be completely batty, and I could be shown wrong, just as I was wrong about astral projection and telepathy and clairvoyance. I could be wrong about this. But for the moment, that's what I'm having a go at, because I think it's our only chance of getting out of the theatre.